good morning, friends, family, and partners. You're uh, connecting with us this morning. It's River East London, and behalf of pastors Andre, Jenny, Tash, and myself, and the entire team, we just want to say we are so glad that you are joining us today. Yes, we are part, busy with part two. Pastor Kevin is busy with part two of his series, and I know it was a humdinger towards the end. We, we, we didn't even know what to talk about, what to really pitched to because there were so many exciting things about the persistent faiths and not giving in halfway through and I trust that you've had a good week. I trust that you've been pushing in, persevering and becoming faithful regular in what we are doing but I know today we're going to carry on with that series. Well, once there, there were many scriptures like you said that's what I love about Pastor Kevin's preaching yes. as well is that there are so many scriptures so you can go back maybe you didn't catch everything immediately but I do encourage you go over your notes again even if you just jot down the scriptures go back to it because the Holy Spirit yeah. is our teacher so whatever you missed uh, during the, the actual sermon the Holy Spirit's the one who's going to be faithful and is going to take you further um, but I was just thinking there was one scripture that stood out from last week and that's Hebrews 11 6 that says without faith it's impossible mm -hmm. to please God mm -hmm. and I think that's just where I got stuck in this journey for now is that I actually can please God but not without faith yeah. so it's a faith journey and throughout the Bible there is that thread this is a good race and it's a race that we are going to win right. if we choose. So come, uh, join us this morning. I know it's going to be good. But above all, regardless who delivers the word, the word itself will produce. Right. So when you sit and you listen and you internalize, even afterwards, something miraculous is going to take place mm -hmm. with inside of you. So we invite you to, to join us this morning. It's going to be awesome, I know. That's right. So if you're watching for the first time ever, and you're not 100% sure who we are, you can go to our websites. Mm -hmm. Just type in rivereastlondon.co.za uh, or .com. We're on both sites. And as well as you can go to Facebook, just type in River East London and you will find our page. Just press like and then you can follow everything. Write us anything that you feel. If you've got questions, whatever else, you're welcome to interact with us. But what we're going to do now is we're going to go straight into the service. We know that God is omnipresent. He's in your home. He is right here where we're about to worship Him. So let's collectively, through whatever circumstances you might find yourself, prison, hospital, in home, an office, maybe you go to work, maybe you're not even in our time zone and you're outside of His zone somewhere else having to do whatever else, but collectively we can still worship God. And I know this morning is going to be good. So let's go into the service and let's together just praise the King of Kings. Father, we thank you for who you are, that you are a loving God, that you are a good God. And Father, in this morning, we just lift up our voices to you. We, as we raise up our hands to you, we worship you, we adore you for who you are, for what you've done, and also for what you are going to do in our lives. What a mighty God you are. How awesome are you. How magnificent is your name. The name above all names. The name of Jesus, the name of Jesus, hallelujah, hallelujah, amen, amen. Come on, I want you, if you're in this place and if you have a breath, if you're alive, I want you to give Jesus the biggest praise offering you can. What a mighty name, what a mighty God, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. It's all about Jesus, no one else, nothing else. Amen, amen. You can take your seats if you can. Thank you so much. Well, what a great uh, privilege and honor it is to be back with each and every one of you. For those of you joining us all the way from uh, TV land all around the world, a very good morning to each and every one of you. Are you excited to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. amen. How many of you are ready to receive all that God has for you in this morning through His Word, His spoken Word? Amen. So last week we spoke about the fact that according to the book of James, he says it is not so much about faith, and it is also not simply about action. It is the combination of both. In other words, putting our faith into action. Amen. But we went one step further last week by saying, that it is not so much about just putting our faith into action. It is about persistent faith 
consistent action. Persistent faith, consistent action. So we asked the question last week, what is faith? And this morning I want to look at a couple of other definitions from the word. I want you to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Now this morning we're going to go and delve into the word of God and there's a couple of different verses that I'm going to share. 2 Corinthians 5, chapter, or chapter 5, verse 7 in the King James, it says that we walk by faith and not by sight. The Message Bible says it this way. It says, it's what we trust in but don't see that keeps us going. That's an incredible way to see what faith is all about. To understand that we walk by faith and not by sight. So, in other words, if we use this particular scripture as reference, the opposite of faith then is not doubt, but sight. Let me say this this way. You see, it's not what you see, it's sometimes what you don't see. Then there's those who see, but they do not see. Let me say that again. You can see and not see. And then there are others who will not see, but see. Some of you are still lost. Let me explain it this way. If you look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, in the King James, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. In other words, when you walk by faith, the Bible says you walk by faith and you see things in the spiritual realm. It is as real to you as you can physically see them with your physical eye. That is what true faith is. True faith is seeing it before it even manifests in the natural. Amen. But you see it. How many of you are trusting God for something truly significant in this morning? You say, I'm trusting God for something. Now, if it is a physical thing, here's the thing. You may not see it physically right now as of yet. But how many of you who've just raised your hand in the spiritual realm because of your faith and because you are applying your faith into that particular situation, you say, I can see it. Amen. You can see it. Why? Because in the spiritual realm, it already manifests. You see it. And because you put your faith into action, it will become a reality in the flesh. Amen. So Hebrews 11 verse 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The author of Hebrews goes on by the, uh, into the next chapter, chapter 12, and likens faith to a race. Listen to what he says, and again, I want to read this from the Message Bible because it's just so interesting. It says, start running, never quit, with an exclamation mark. This morning, I'm here to tell you to never quit. Some of you saying, you know, I'm waiting for that cue. I'm waiting for that that sound to go off for me to start that race. Well, the race has started. Amen. If you are alive and you are breathing and you are listening to the sound of my voice, it means that without you maybe even realizing it, you've already started, you've already begun to run the race of life. Amen. So other people may have lapped you already. But you know what? Start. Start running. And you know what? Never quit. It says, no extra spiritual fat, no parasitic sins. Keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race we're in. Study how he did it, because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God. He could put up with anything along the way, the cross, shame, whatever. And now he's there in the place of honor, right alongside God. Now listen to this particular part. When you find yourselves flagging in your faith, that means to struggle in your faith. Go over that story again. What is it? The story of Jesus, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Item by item, that long litany of hostility he plowed through, that will shoot adrenaline into your souls. So in other words, when you look at what Jesus had accomplished on this earth in three and a half years, Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. But luckily, he didn't end the sentence with a full stop and that was it. No, no, no. He said, in this world, you will have 
troubles. But be of good cheer. Why? Because I have overcome this world. In other words, he has finished the race. This is why the Message Bible writes it in such a way to say to us that when you are feeling low, when you feel that the things of this earth is dragging you down, what do you do? You take your word, the Bible, and you begin to devour it. You begin to read it. And not only do you begin to read it, you begin to stand on every promise contained in the word of God. And what do we do? You put your faith into action. And when you do that, the Bible, the Message Bible says that will shoot adrenaline into your souls. Come on. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You know, you see someone there, you know, you've ran a race. I remember there was this, I did the 1,200 meters when I was in, um, in primary school. I, I didn't even practice for it. I didn't even know how to run. All I knew was a 100 meter, you know, sprint. That was all I knew how to run. So guess what? I started running. You know, I started sprinting that 1,200 meters like I would do the 100 meters. And then later I began you know, to, to struggle. I mean, by that first lap, yes, I was, you know, um, the first one to, to finish that lap. But I was really struggling. And I remember there were a couple of people, you know, that last lap, which I really had to dig deep in to, to finish it. I remember there were a couple of people cheering me on. And you know what? It was like adrenaline just shot into my soul. And I was able to, to I mean, my uh, sight went like dark. You know, it looked like the, the grass was about, you know, as high as I was, uh, you know, that particular time. And, and I just felt that naturally I had nothing left within me because I gave it all in the early stages of that race, not knowing how to take on such a race. But because people were cheering me on, adrenaline came in. And you know what? I was able to finish that race. I didn't do well. I, I, I actually came last in that race. But you know what? I never quit. What was sad, you know, is about the third lap. I remember that there was a guy, who, you know, he, he, he went past the finish line and then he just went into the middle because he quit. There were people that quit that race, but you know what? I finished it. I mean, I was lost, dead lost, but you know what? I was alive. I felt after that, after that race that I had nothing left within me, but I completed it. I never gave up. In some of your translations that you would have in the King James, the NIV, it says it this way. It says, let us run with endurance the race set before us. And as we said, you know, life is a race. And I'm here to tell you this morning and encourage you that you can do it. Amen. You can do it. Why? Because he already did it. Come on. That is supposed to shoot adrenaline into your souls. That is supposed to ignite your faith, knowing that because he did it, you can do it too. Amen. But you ask, well, why is this significant? Why are we in this race? Why am I here? And it all has to do with the great plan and purpose that God has for you. And again, there's some of you who say, well, I don't even know if God has a plan and a purpose for me. There's some of you who say, well, I only wish that I could discover God's great plan and purpose for me. Well, you've come to the right place. If you haven't yet discovered that, we will work with you. We'll pray with you, trust with you, and believe that God will reveal his great plan and purpose for your individual life. And maybe you've never heard it before, and I'm here to tell you today that Jesus absolutely loves you. He loves you. For this moment, just in the stillness of where you are right now, just hear him say these words to you as he says, I love you. You know, there's a story that they tell that's a story of Roger Bannister. How many of you know who he is? Or well, you've heard his story before? It's not just a story, it actually happened. It happened in 1954, on the 6th of May to be exact. He was the one who attempted to go and run the mile in under four minutes. Everyone said to him, it's impossible. There were even scientists at that stage who said that the human body is built in a particular way, and because of the limitations of the human body, there is no way that any human being is able to complete the mile in under four minutes. Just the day before he actually ran that race, he slipped and fell on a polished floor, and he was limping that entire day. But race day came a day that he had prepared for. Now even understand that even in his training, he was not able to accomplish that. So he went out that day and he, and he was running. Now here's the thing, because he was so adamant that he would do it, people came 
to come and see what was going to unfold. There were those who doubted because everyone said it's impossible, but they wanted to see what the human body, what the human mind can achieve. So they came out and he got out and he started running. And um, what's incredible is that he had one lap left and at that lap he was already just over three minutes. So in other words, he had to do that last lap in less than 59 seconds or 59 seconds exactly in order for him to come in at under the four minute mark. And uh, there's actually the video on YouTube available so you can see how he, you know, he actually accomplished that. But what's incredible is you see that that last lap, he, he had nothing left. But what happened? People were cheering him on. And because of that, the fact that people were cheering him on, what was incredible is that it's, you know, give him that adrenaline surge that he needed in order to accomplish. He crashed over that finish line, and the moment he got over that finish line, he just collapsed. It was as if his human body just shut down. And he later says that in his mind, he knew that he had done it. So they wait for the announcement. This was before the digital age of today where you see the time on the field. So they waited for the announcement. And it says that when the announcement came in, that his time was three minutes. People didn't even hear the rest of the how many seconds because the three minutes already was the giveaway. And people started cheering. People started clapping. People couldn't even believe that that was possible. He did it in three minutes, 59.4 seconds. So he just did it. But you know what? He achieved, according to scientists, according to people who understood the sport, he achieved the impossible. He did what no man had ever done before, at least in recorded history. He had done what no man ever walking on the face of this earth had ever done. But what's incredible is that 46 days later, someone else did it. You see, it takes someone to do the supposedly impossible to ignite someone else's faith and believing that now it is possible. I'm going somewhere. Hold on to your hats, to your Bibles. What's incredible is that 10 years later, in 1964, would you guess, would you believe it, that a high school student was able to do it? A high school student. Now understand, this was before competitive running. This was before people had a, a psychologist, a, a, a physio, a, all kinds of different therapists, you know, eating plans. It was before all of that. But here is a high school student in 1964 who had done it. To date, high school students are doing it every single year. After that time in 1954, thousands upon thousands of people have accomplished that feat. The seemingly impossible. All it takes is for one person, one person to prove that which everyone said was impossible to overcome that and it gives everyone the faith knowing that it is possible. But in light of the word of God, that now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. No one had ever seen it done before. But yet it happened. And in light of the scripture, knowing that when we look at Jesus and we're reminded of what Jesus had accomplished in the three and a half years, the death on the cross and his resurrection, the fact that he said, remain in Jerusalem until you are clothed with power from on high. Next week, Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. I don't know about you, but I've got a great expectation. Amen. Amen. But what's incredible is that Jesus made certain promises. Jesus did what no man had ever done before. And then his disciples grabbed hold of it. And this is why in his name they started to perform great signs, wonders, and miracles. Because of the example set by one person. Showing them that what the world calls impossible is possible through Christ Jesus. I'm reminded of the words that Apostle Paul spoke when he said that you can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens you. It is through his strength, his ability and might and power within us that we are able to do the seemingly impossible. All we need to do right now is believe. You know, we look at the situation in South Africa. 
in so many fronts, from a church point of view, from a political point of view, and we see that things need to change. There are those who say it's impossible, it's already gone too far. But yet we know that throughout history, God has done other things that are supposedly impossible, but yes, it became possible because there were those who believed. And I believe it is by no chance that we have embarked on the 50 days of prayer in this time for our nation and for the church as a whole. And I believe that we are soon going to see real change, not because of politics or politicians, but because men and women of God rose to the occasion and said that we serve a God who makes the impossible possible. And through Him, we can do all things. Amen. Hebrews 11 verse 6 in the Amplified, it reads, it says, But without faith it is impossible to walk with God and please Him. For whoever comes near to God must necessarily believe that God exists and that He rewards those who earnestly and diligently seek Him. Now understand, we are talking about faith and faith in action. To seek is an action. Amen. Amen. It is an action. However, when you speak to some Christians, they you know, would claim, as Matthew 6, verse 33 says, you know, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto you. You ask them, you know, what are you doing in this moment in, in, in time in your life? No, I'm seeking God. I'm seeking His kingdom. Well, why am I not seeing you doing anything about it? What, you, you, you're just professing your faith, but show me your action. Show me your deed. What are you doing? You, say, you see, to merely proclaim that you are seeking God's kingdom or to just read these words out loud is not seeking His kingdom. Amen. Because it's a verb. It's an action. And we need to actively and persistently and consistently engage in action. It's not so much to just say, well, I've got faith. Any one of us can pro uh, profess that we've got faith. But the book of James says, that don't just talk about your faith. Show me the action based on your faith. You see, it's not just about the action, and it's also not just about faith alone. It's about the combination of both, putting our faith into action. The word seek, as we said, is an action. And the scripture in Hebrews 11 verse 6 says that we should diligently seek him. Diligently is defined as something which is of energetic effort. In other words, it's not just passive. It's, it's something that's energetic. It's something you value. It's something you treasure quite deeply. And it's something that you delight over. Amen. So when you say, I'm seeking the kingdom of God, that means that you engage in some form of action, that you advance God's kingdom. You cannot do it with a frown on your face. Amen. That is not diligently, earnestly seeking Him. Amen. Amen. You see, in, in light of Matthew 6, verse 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. I've said this before, and I want to share this again. Is that many people out there will applaud you when you go out and seek first His kingdom. But it would be the very same people who will criticize you once all things are added. Think about that. People are quick and easy to applaud you when you first seek out the kingdom of God. But when, as soon as all things are added, the criticism comes. In the same way, last week we, we spoke about faith and we spoke about the fact that it wasn't the faith aspect that got that person into trouble, but it was the action that got that person into trouble. So people will applaud our faith, but sometimes criticize our action based on our faith. You know, so many times, you know, we look at faith and we look at action and still people are confused about this concept. Someone once explained it this way. It's, a, it's an old boatman. He explained it this way to his fellow sailors. He took a small little rowing boat and he had two oars. On the one oar, he wrote down the word faith. On the other oar, he wrote down the word action. So he said to them, I want you to take that first oar, faith, and I want you to row it as hard and as best as you can. They did that, and they went into a circular motion. How many of you have ever rowed before? What happens when you only use the one oar? You go in a circle. 
So then he said to them, okay, now leave that paddle or that oar of faith alone and then use the other one, the one which says action. And they did that. And then they also went into a circular motion, only this time it was the other side or the other direction. It was counterclockwise in this particular situation. So then he said to them, now I want you in perfect harmony, use both of those oars, both faith and action. And you know what? They went in a straight line and they were able to reach their destination. That is what it means to put our faith into action. It's no use for you to simply go and engage in action, but God is not in it. Amen. In the same way, it's going to mean nothing for you if you just sit in your prayer closet just professing your faith and you never go out and you engage in any form of action based on your belief, based on your faith in God. In James chapter 2 verse 20, and we've shared this before, it says that faith without action is dead. It means nothing. In light of the scripture, I want to point your attention to the book of Mark, Mark chapter 5. And I want to share this with you. We all know this story so well. It is, the, it is the story of the lady, the woman with the issue of blood. And it says in verse 26, Mark chapter 5, verse 26, it says that she had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew even worse. Now understand, here's someone who spent all she had on doctors, but she never ever got well. So you can say that the doctors exhausted their wisdom, their earthly wisdom, and she exhausted her finances. So in other words, she was at a place where she had nothing, nothing left. But upon reading further, we see the only thing that she still had left was that which couldn't be seen. It was her faith. Because it was her faith that caused her then, in verse 27, to act. In verse 27, it says, When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, the hem of his garment, another translation says, because she thought... If I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. The Amplified says in verse 28, it says, For she kept saying, and I believe that this is what she did. If you look at the Greek, it speaks about the, you know, that, she, that she spoke about it. It's one thing to think about it. It's another thing to speak it. The Bible says that thou shalt decree a thing, and it shall be established. So this woman was someone who went out and said that if only I could have an encounter with Jesus, I know that everything will change. So if you are here in this place, I'm here to tell you that all you need is to encounter Him. And when you encounter Him, based on the promises contained in His Word, not my opinion, not philosophy, based on His Word, he is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, and above all that you may wish or ask for in this morning. Because that is who he is. Listen to this. She said, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Then it says she went out into action and immediately, immediately, not the next day, not next week, not next month, not next year. Immediately, her bleeding stopped. And she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. Immediately, she felt it. Immediately. In the Amplified, it says, immediately her flow of blood was dried up at the source. You see, here we find the source of life, God, going to the source of her problem. It's only God who can do that. You see... Scientists and people who are very clever doctors make all kinds of pills and all kinds of medication, yet you find that even that cannot always get to the source of the problem. But God is the one who went to the source of a problem, and it dried up at the source. 
immediately it stopped and she felt it in her body that she was healed so remember that she felt it then it says in verse 30 at once so immediately she felt it and at once immediately Jesus realized that the power had gone from him so he felt it as well so immediately she felt it and immediately he felt it and Jesus then turned around in the crowd and asked who touched my clothes who touched me then it says you see the people crowding against you his disciples answered and yet you can ask who touched me in other words they were saying well Jesus just look around in the beginning of this particular story it says that the people were almost to the point of suffocating him so close they were pushing against him so the disciple is saying well Jesus why are you even asking that because everyone is touching you everyone is pressing everyone is pulling why are you even asking that but they didn't realize verse 32 it says but Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it he's looking he's looking he's looking verse 33 then the woman knowing what had happened to her came and fell at his feet trembling with fear told him the whole truth and he said to her daughter your faith has healed you but listen to this he said daughter your faith has healed you in another translation it says your faith has made you whole but here's the thing she had faith the whole time it was faith that caused her to be there in the first place she was unclean therefore not allowed to be amongst the crowd she knew this is why she was trembling with fear because she knew she was caught she was found out and the laws at the time allowed the Jews to go and stone her because of her act because she was unclean because of her issue but what's incredible is to understand that she had faith all along so remember that there were other people as well maybe there that had faith we also know that other people pressed against him other people also touched him but it doesn't say that they also received a miracle of some sorts so here we have people who have faith but don't receive their miracle here we are the have on the other hand people who touched him engage in action but didn't receive their miracle it was only when she reached out by faith and touched the hem of his garment because she kept saying that if only I had that opportunity if only I could meet him if only I could reach out and touch him I know that I would be healed so she only received her miracle when she reached out to Jesus when she put her faith into action come on church but listen to this verse 32 but Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it he wasn't satisfied by the disciples just saying to him well Jesus everyone is touching you. he says no 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 you don't understand someone touched me. Jesus was on his way to go to a person that was dying understand that so Jesus was supposed to be in a hurry yet he has time for this unclean woman Jesus walks on his way to go and perform this other miracle but because of this woman's faith in action it causes Jesus to stop not only does it cause Jesus to stop but he looks at the crowd he looks and the Bible says he kept on looking looking to see who it was that put 
their faith into action. And I'm reminded of the book of Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 16 verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord range to and fro throughout the earth, strengthening those hearts whose hearts are fully committed, faithful to Him. That is what He wants to do. That is what He wants to do for you. That is what He wants to do for you. Allow Him to enter in and touch you and minister to you. Put your faith into action and you will too encounter the miraculous. Well, there we go. I, 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 I don't know, Tash, I'm still stuck at the rowing part. Uh, I'm thinking if I have faith and I'm going to row just by faith, by, by faith, I can see myself going this way around. And then I see if I row by action and action, action, I'm just going to go that way around. So I just realized I've got to row both sides at the same time to get the fix that we are actually looking forward to. Persistent faith. What a great series we're busy with. Well, I'm quite keen to know what's going to happen next week as well, because I'm sure, just like myself, that you are on this journey and that something is happening inside your heart, inside your head, and that things are actually happening in the, in the lives of those around you too. Remember that you are blessed to be a blessing. I know I often say it, maybe in the right or the wrong times, but that is what our faith is all about. That is why you come to church. That's why you go to a home cell or midweek, that you can get filled up, not just for you, but that you too can pass that blessing on to others. So yes, um, I think the, the boat analogy was, was, was pretty good. And um, I, I think that's where I'm, I'm too. But I'm always reminded that this faith journey is a good faith journey. It's not a, bad, it's not a thing that you are meant to be um, you know, in, in, in a bad place about, yeah. even though it might be hard, even though there are trials or temptations, but it's a good fight of faith. If Paul could do it, Pastor Paul, then so can you and I. Amen. That's right. Now, Paul writes in Ephesians, and he makes this statement, after you've done everything, mm. remain standing. That is faith in action. Faith is knowing you can get the victory. Remain standing is your action, not giving up. So our prayer is, on behalf of everybody here, that this week, you're going to have a wonderful week. You're going to have a week where you're going to be strengthened. You're going to stand on the Word of God. You will not waver, and you're going to walk in His goodness. So from all of us, until we see you again next week, we trust you'll have an awesome week. God bless you. And remember, remain standing until we see you again. Thank you.